Good afternoon, everyone. This is Dr. Trinkatella, and today I'm going to be lecturing on circadian disruption, sleep, and hormones, applying what we know about biological rhythms to support sleep and hormone balance. There's our disclaimer, and there's me. I've been a naturopathic doctor for 22 years, and um, doing a variety of things. I'm a co-founder of Integrative Medicine Academy with Dr. Wohler. Um, my focus in practice is on women's health, adrenal and thyroid issues, autoimmune diseases, and GI disorders. So since we're talking about circadian rhythm, which is basically about time, I like this quote from Albert Einstein, who says that the only reason for time is so that everything doesn't happen at once. And so that's what we're talking about today, the timing of physiological events and why it's important to pay attention to that. So over the past decade, the field of chronobiology has rapidly expanded as researchers have begun unraveling the complex and integral role that the circadian clock plays in most physiological processes. In order for the body to optimize energy and function, daily biological activities do not occur at the same time. Genes will turn on and off at specific times throughout a 24-hour cycle to synchronize events and optimize function. Clocks, which are mechanisms to mark the passage of time, are inherent in all living organisms and provide a means of tracking and organizing biological events and behavior. The study of biological timing is called chronobiology. So why is timing important? So despite the fact that we all live in a world where food and light are readily available at all hours of the day, our daily pattern of light and dark is, is still governed, um, is go governs our behavior and our physiology. So we're still very attuned to the patterns of light and dark. Operating against our natural biological rhythms results in several chronic disease processes that can undermine physical and mental health. Applying our knowledge of the circadian rhythm to how we live, eat, and sleep supports the foundations of optimal health and can serve as a backdrop to additional therapies providing a greater opportunity for successful outcomes. So by paying attention to the circadian rhythm and when our body is most equipped to do certain things, we can optimize function and support our body in a way that is very foundational and fundamental to good health. So today I'm gonna to be going over just biological rhythms and give you a definition of what biological rhythms are and um, what different kinds of rhythms that we have, what the mechanics of the circadian rhythm are. Um, we're gonna talk about cortisol and melatonin as regulators or uh, framers of, of that circadian rhythm. We're gonna talk about what disrupts the circadian rhythm, what happens to insulin and sex hormones, we're gonna talk about causes of circadian disruption and how we can live, sleep, and eat to support normal rhythms. So chronobiology, as I said, is the formal study of biological temporal rhythms that occur in all living organisms. Biological rhythms are any cyclical change in the level of a bodily chemical or function. These biological rhythms may occur in periods of less than 24 hours, within a 24 hour period, or longer than 24 hours. Biological rhythms are related to cycles of light and dark, lunar cycles, seasonal, and annual cycles. So for humans, we're more attuned to patterns of light and dark, um, as are most mammals. Lunar cycles are predominantly associated with the menstrual cycle in women. Seasonal and annual cycles, um, we may respond to seasonal cycles because of increasing and decreasing daylight. Um, but you know, the seasonal and annual cycles, you see them um, most predominantly represented uh, physiologically uh, more in the natural world or in the animal kingdom. So there's different biological rhythms. We have circadian rhythm, diurnal rhythm, ultradian and infradian rhythms. The circadian rhythm is our endogenous rhythm with a period of, of about 24 hours. So circadian means about a day. So we have a free running rhythm that goes for a little bit longer than 24 hours. And our body will be entrained by the patterns, the environmental patterns of light and dark to train it to a 24 hour period. 
Diurnal rhythms are a circadian rhythm that is synchronized with the cycles of day and night. Ultradian rhythms are usually shorter than 24 hours, and infradian rhythms are cycles that are typically longer than 24 hours. So there are extra, external influences on these biological rhythms or these clocks that we have, and they're referred to as Zeitgebers or time givers. It's a German word for time giver. And what a Zeitgeber is, is an external cue from the environment that influences or entrains our circadian rhythms. So things like light, temperature, food, and activity. So if we have a, a free running circadian rhythm that is closer to 25 hours, the Zeitgeber of light that occurs every day when the sun comes up resets that clock to a 24 hour clock rather than a 25 hour clock. So what the Zeitgebers do is they entrain those natural, internal, physiological, or behavioral events to match what is going on within the environment. So we have internal and external rhythms. The internal rhythms are endogenous and they're controlled by internal biological clocks that are either central or peripheral. And we'll go into more detail about that later. External rhythms are exogenous or environmental influencers. Those internal rhythms synchronize with or are entrained by external stimuli or zeitgebers that help to reset the biological clock to a 24-hour day. So circadian rhythms control the timing of physiological or behavioral events that occur every 24 hours. So sleep and wakefulness, body temperature, hormone secretion, blood pressure, digestive secretions, and levels of alertness and reaction time. So all of these events are um, better or fluctuate at certain times during the day. And so here is a circadian clock imposed on the Vitruvian man to kind of show you what events usually happen uh, within a 24 hour period. So we have times of the day when our body temperature is lowest and we have times of day when it's highest. We have times of low blood pressure and higher blood pressure. We have times of uh, melatonin secretion and times when melatonin secretion stops. We have times when we're more mentally focused uh, or we're better um, equipped to deal with athletic events or later in the day when we have a faster reaction time and better coordination. So these kinds of things and having an awareness of these kinds of things can help us to perhaps schedule our time in our day so that the things that we're doing are more in tune with our circadian rhythms. So we have endogenous mechanisms that regulate the circadian rhythm. We have the master clock, the peripheral clocks, and the clock genes. The master clock is located in the suprachiasmatic nucleus, which is in the hypothalamus of the brain, right above the optic chiasm and about three centimeters behind the eyes. This master clock coordinates the timing of all of the peripheral clocks. The peripheral clocks are present in nearly every tissue and organ system, and they're reset by the central clock every 24 hours. Clock genes within those peripheral clocks and tissues uh, create proteins that become the timekeeping devices that track time through the creation and degradation of certain proteins within a 24 hour cycle. So there's this like hierarchy of control. We have the master clock, which is responsive to signals of light and dark that reset the peripheral clocks, that set the timing within the clock genes. So the master clock um, is located in the hypothalamus, which is the command central for many functions related to hunger, satiety, sleep, the stress response, metabolic rate, and fluid balance. And the cells that make up the suprachiasmatic nucleus are indirectly linked to the pituitary gland, which produces growth hormone and stimulates cortisol, thyroid, and gonadal hormones. The endocrine system and its role in the secretion of hormones are crucial elements of circadian rhythms in the central and peripheral clock. So we have all of this feedback going on. The suprachiasmatic nucleus being located in the hypothalamus and its relationship to the pituitary gland sets the timing of events when it comes to hormone release. 
melatonin and glucocorticoids have both been linked to peripheral clock regulation. When I talk about glucocorticoids, I'm really talking more about cortisol. Um, and they're thought to be endogenous synchronizers that help to stabilize and reinforce the circadian rhythm. So we know that melatonin is secreted at night when it gets dark and cortisol um, is secreted or peaks early in the morning and tapers as the day goes on. So they have a diurnal rhythm. So they have a pattern that is related to um, the patterns of light and dark within a 24 hour period. So the master clock of melatonin, um, the suprachiasmatic nucleus is indirectly linked to the pineal gland, which produces melatonin. And the master clock resets daily from exposure to light coming into the brain through the retina. Melanopsin, which is a light sensing protein in the retina, is most sensitive to blue light and least sensitive to red light. And I think that's important to note because it's the melanopsin that is that light sensing protein that sends a message to the suprachiasmatic nucleus. And so when we talk about blue light, I think we're all aware of where blue light comes from. It's on all of our devices, on our computer screens. It is on um, our, div our phones, uh, our TVs, and a lot of the lights we use in our home, if you're using comp compact fluorescent bulbs, there's a lot of blue light. So if we're being exposed to a lot of blue light, in the evening hours, it's gonna suppress melatonin production. So being that melanopsin is least sensitive to red light, turning lights down in the evening and um, blocking blue light as much as possible supports the production of melatonin. So that light message is conveyed through melanopsin to the pineal gland via the paraventricular nucleus, the intermedial lateral cell column in the spine, and the superior cer cervical ganglion, and it shuts down the melatonin production once that light message is received. As light dims, as we enter into twilight and nighttime, melatonin levels rise again. So here's just a diagram of that whole sequence I just described. Light entering the retina, going through the suprachiasmatic nucleus, through the paraventricular nucleus, down the spinal column and back up to the pineal gland. So that's how that message of light is conveyed. The master clock and glucocorticoids. Uh, glucocorticoids are a group of steroid hormones synthesized in the adrenal cortex that are involved in the synchronization of the central and peripheral clocks. Neurochemical signals to the hypothalamus will stimulate neurons in the paraventricular nucleus to release corticotropin releasing hormone and arginine vasopressin, which induces the production of ACTH synthesis uh, in the pituitary gland. ACTH then induces adrenal synthesis um, and secretion of glucocorticoids, which interact with specific receptors in various target tissues in the brain and periphery. So we have glucocorticoid receptors in just about every tissue of our body. So that gives you a good indication of its influence on your physiology. If we have receptors everywhere for cortisol, it plays a key role in our physiology. So the peripheral clocks exist in just about every tissue and they play an integral and unique role in each of their respective tissues, driving the circadian expression of specific genes involved in a variety of physiological functions. Each peripheral clock can adapt to its own external and internal stimuli, such as feeding cues for the liver, kidney, and pancreas, but is conducted by the light dark cues sensed by the central master clock. So as I was saying before, this is kind of like a hierarchy effect. You know, the light comes in, stimulates the suprachiasmatic nucleus, things start to happen, a message gets sent to the peripheral clocks to reset, but they also have their own um, mechanisms to respond to internal cues within the cells. So even though on a grand level they're regulated by the master clock and the secretion of cortisol, um, they have to also respond to internal cues within the cell. So they, they can regulate themselves in this larger picture. And as I said, peripheral clocks are found in just about every tissue and organ system. Glucocorticoids in the autonomic nervous system act as a bridge between the master clock 
and almost all of the peripheral clogs. So there's, there's receptors for cortisol in just about every tissue. So that shows how important it is. So then we move down to within each of the cells, there are clock genes. And this is the major mechanism of how time is marked, is through these clock genes and the proteins that they create. So you've got this interaction of these genes as a major driving force behind this rhythmic expression of clock controlled proteins. So what happens is that these proteins get transcribed, sent into the cytoplasm, um, where they build up, they re-enter the nucleus of the cell, and they inhibit further transcription of that protein. So it's this buildup of protein and this degradation of protein within uh, the period of about 24 hours that helps that cell to actually mark the passage of a single day. So there's a real material mechanism involved in tracking time at the cellular level. So it's a coordinated effort of the central and the peripheral clocks. Both the central and peripheral clocks can be reset by environmental cues. The predominant zeitgeber for the central clock is light, which is sensed by melanopsin, and to a lesser extent, the rods and cones in the retina of the eyes. The central clock entrains the peripheral clocks through neuronal and hormonal signals, body temperature, and feeding related cues, aligning all clocks with the external light dark cycle. Circadian rhythms allow an organism to achieve temporal homeostasis with its environment at the molecular level by regulating gene expression to create a peak of protein expression once every 24 hours. So that's where the clock genes are involved. Disruptions in the circadian rhythm can contribute to the pathology of several disease processes. So when we think about how fundamental the, these timing mechanisms are to our health and how it is connected to external cues, we know that we can have some influence by influencing those external cues and we can entrain or retrain our central and peripheral clocks so that they're more synchronized to what is natural and normal for our physiology. So here's just a diagram basically of everything that I explained. So to the right of the screen, you basically see at the cellular level um, how these clock proteins are formed and degraded and how they create that negative feedback loop. Um, they feed back to the central clock, the central clock signals to them. We have those peripheral clocks that have uh, those, those clock genes within all of uh, the cells of all of the organ systems that they affect. And the whole thing is managed by patterns of light and dark. So let's talk a little bit about cortisol and melatonin as regulators of peripheral clocks and on why we look at melatonin and why we look at, at uh, cortisol. So we know that melatonin is elevated at night and that cortisol is typically higher during the day. So they have this opposite pattern. So they sort of frame the day. We also know that cortisol has a diurnal rhythm. Its output has a predictable pattern in a 24 hour cycle and is the most widely used measurable marker of the circadian clock because of its large amplitude of variation and a daily reproducibility. And amplitude basically just means that um, there's a big difference between the output in the morning and the output in the evening. So we know that there is a strong um, pulse and rhythm of cortisol. A normal pattern of cortisol output over a 24 hour period shows the acrophase, which occurs between six and 10 a.m. So that's when cortisol peaks. We have declining levels throughout the day and a quiescent period of minimal secretory activity between 10 p.m. and 2 a.m. So that's when it's dropping off to its lowest point. And then at some point in the evening, we'll have an abrupt elevation um, during late sleep, not in the evening, so to speak, but more later in the night, um, hours before we're waking up, you'll start to see an elevation of cortisol. So this is the, the chronic stress response. So when we talk about normal patterns of cortisol, 
Um, most of us have probably done a salivary cortisol test where you're looking at four timed measurements throughout the day, where you're looking at morning, noon, afternoon, and nighttime output of cortisol. And it should take a typical pattern of being highest in the morning and tapering as the day goes on. There are a lot of things that can interfere with a normal stress response. And all of those potential sources of stress are listed over on the left side of the screen. That feeds into this system, creating a stressor, and it can result in imbalances uh, within the HPA axis that not only in, uh, involve physiological imbalances, but can go on further to present with clinical conditions like allergies, fatigue, headache, autoimmune disease, cardiovascular disease, insomnia, blood sugar uh, poor blood sugar control, depression, uh, irritable bowel, digestive problems. So you name it, it can underlie a number of disease processes by just a simple dysregulation of the HPA axis and its relationship to circadian rhythms. Melatonin also has a relationship to circadian rhythms. Um, it can also be used to entrain the circadian rhythm to a 24 hour cycle. So for people who have like a delayed sleep phase, uh, can't get to sleep until very late in the evening and then they can't wake up in the morning. You can use melatonin to entrain your uh, circadian rhythm. So melatonin along with cortisol is responsible for synchronize, synchronization of the central and peripheral clocks allowing temporal organization of biological functions within a 24-hour circadian cycle. Measures of melatonin are one of the best peripheral indices of human circadian timing. So these are things that we can measure. We can measure cortisol and we can measure melatonin and it can give us a really good idea of how well somebody is attuned to uh, a normal circadian rhythm. Other actions of melatonin are it's a potent antioxidant, um, it protects the brain, it helps to detoxify the brain, it protects bone, it helps with bone formation, it supports reproduction, uh, it's immune and cardiovascular regulation, and it also decreases insulin secretion. Those with a uh, delayed sleep phase syndrome, as I was mentioning, people who can't get to sleep until real late in the evening, you can use melatonin a couple of hours before your intended bedtime along with dimming the lights to try and advance that sleep phase so that you go to bed earlier, you get sleepy earlier, um, so that you can wake up at your designated time without feeling fatigued. Studies have shown circadian entrainment with melatonin in blind people with non-24. So you've probably heard of non-24, there's like ads for it on the radio sometimes. People with non-24 are not able to detect light and dark. So their free running circadian rhythm, which is somewhere between 24 and 25 hours, is not attuned with the rotation of the earth and the, in the rising and setting of the sun because it's extended beyond that 24 hour period. So as time goes on, they go to bed later and later and later until at some point down the line, they resync with that 24 hour period. But most of the time they're spent um, perhaps outside of that um, entrained circadian rhythm. So you can use melatonin in these people to help synchronize their circadian rhythm to 24 hour period by giving them some melatonin a couple of hours before their intended bedtime. So during the initial entrainment process, dosing can be upwards of 10 milligrams within one to two hours of intended bedtime. Once they have established that entrainment and they're going to bed at their desired time and they're able to go to sleep, a maintenance dose can range from anywhere between 0.5 to 3 milligrams per night. So dosing for melatonin for some people can be very variable. Some people are very tolerant of high doses, other people are not. Um, if you wake up feeling very groggy, then the melatonin dosage that you took is probably too high for you. Um, it also can induce very vivid dreams, which is not necessarily a bad dream unless you have nightmares, of course, but um, you know, that's one of the side effects of, of melatonin. So we do have ways of assessing these things. As you know, adrenal stress profiles, where you're doing salivary measurements of cortisol, um, there is other testing looking at uh, melatonin. There's something called dim light melatonin output, or those little typo there, that should be DLMO. 
Um, that can be measured in plasma, saliva, or urinary metabolites of melatonin. Um, basically what it looks for is it looks at the total output of melatonin and it looks at the pattern of output. Do you have an advanced sleep phase shift, shift where um, melatonin is being produced too early in the night and you're going to bed way too early and then perhaps waking up in the middle of the night? Or do you have a delayed phase shift where you, your melatonin is being produced too late into the evening? And that can often be caused by exposure to a lot of blue light in the evening where you're not producing enough melatonin uh, to actually get sleepy and go to bed at the right time. So that's a parameter that you can test in plasma, saliva, or urine. Um, adrenal stress profiles, everybody is pretty much familiar with those. You can do, you can add in a few other samples to get a cortisol awakening response, which reveals the body's response to the stress of waking up in the morning. It's kind of like a mini stress test and you're, um, you're monitoring your cortisol output upon waking, uh, 30 minutes after waking and 60 minutes after waking. And that's sort of like this little encapsulated time period to see how well your body responds to the stressor of waking up. Um, is, it, is it a vibrant response? Is it normal? Is it healthy? So that gives us a little bit more information about how you respond to stressors. And ZRT Lab has a sleep balance profile, which um, provides a urinary measurement of cortisol, cortisone, and melatonin metabolite um, in the first and second morning urine, in the evening and at night. Um, you can do a, an add-on of norepinephrine and epinephrine um, to look at specific neurotransmitters that, if they're elevated at night, may be interfering with your sleep. So we can monitor these things and take a look at them. All right, so circadian disruptions. What happens when we disrupt our circadian rhythm? And what are the disruptors? Well, I'm sure some of you already know light exposure. Um, and But it's interesting because Having less access to natural light during the day and more artificial light at night is not a good thing. So if you can access more natural light during the day by being outside or having your windows open or sitting near a window, just getting some natural full spectrum light, um, it will make you less sensitive to light exposure at night, okay? So getting outside as much as possible during the day is important. There's also such a thing as digital jet lag, which is basically just constant connectivity through our devices, you know? So people get roped in to being on their devices. Um, and, you know, before you know it, you look up and maybe an hour, an hour and a half has gone by and you've basically been staring into a light box. There's also social jet lag, and that is basically where you just go to bed later and wake up later on the weekend so you're not maintaining a fairly, um, um, distinct schedule for seven days a week. You know, you kind of get off course. Um, it's almost like, you know, being a shift worker in a way, if you're staying up really late on the weekends and sleeping in later, and then your body has to readjust itself, you know, Sunday night and Monday morning to try and get back into your work schedule. So trying to maintain a, a consistent um, waking and sleeping schedule can really help. Uh, travel jet lag. I think most of us have experienced this where you've crossed time zones, uh, especially traveling from west to east because you're actually losing hours. That can mess up your circadian rhythm and it takes a while to readjust, but you can use melatonin. Um, I think the most important thing is when you are traveling across time zones is to just try and reset that clock as quickly as possible. You can use melatonin to get yourself to sleep um, and you just want to try and wake up at the normal time of where you are and try and reset that, um, that circadian clock. Shift work is a big problem, and it's not only because people just work at night and sleep during the day, but a lot of people have rotating shifts where one day they're working the night shift, then they're working a day shift, so there's no regularity in their schedule. Their body doesn't know what to do. Um, less daytime activity, so remaining sedentary for work or just by choice, sitting around watching TV on your computer a lot, um, that can be problematic because during those daylight hours, we're supposed to be up and moving. Um, that signals to our body that certain things are supposed to happen, so activity is important during the daytime. And also late night snacking is a disruptor because when you're eating food, it readies the body for activity. Your body is thinking when it's receiving food that it has to get ready for some sort of action. 
Digestion also raises your body temperature, and when your body temperature is elevated, it's also a disruptor to circadian rhythm because melatonin secretion is better when your body starts to cool down. All right, so sleep timing disorders. I've kind of mentioned this already, delayed sleep phase syndrome, advanced sleep phase syndrome, and then non-24. So I'm not gonna go into these really deeply. I think you probably have a good idea. Other things that can disrupt our sleep or our effects of our disrupted sleep um, are disrupted glucose metabolism with a reduction in insulin sensitivity and an increase in nocturnal cortisol production. So all of these mechanisms can jump in if we are not sleeping enough. Um, we'll end up with high glucose, um, reduced sensitivity to insulin, and if you have high nighttime cortisol, it's gonna be mobilizing glucose and thereby increasing your insulin. So that's not a good thing. You don't want that to happen when you're sleeping. We'll have an altered rhythm of ghrelin and leptin. Um, ghrelin is the hormone that stimulates your appetite, whereas leptin is the hormone that signals satiety. So if that rhythm is altered, um, you're not going to get a normal response with that. You're gonna get increased ghrelin and decreased leptin sensitivity. So you're gonna feel hungry and wanna eat all the time, um, and you're not gonna feel very satiated. Weight gain as a result of you know, an, an imbalance with this altered rhythm of ghrelin and leptin um, can occur um, because of those stimulators, but also because you've got this dysregulated glucose metabolism. Um, and oftentimes what you find is with people who have poor quality sleep or fragmented sleep, they increase their consumption of fatty uh, foods and carbohydrate rich foods during the day, usually by about 20%, and this results in, in weight gain. So it becomes this vicious cycle. Development of metabolic syndrome. Well, all of those three preceding things can result in metabolic syndrome. And, and that's basically reduced insulin sensitivity, high blood glucose, hypertension, central obesity, and dyslipidemia, so issues with cholesterol and triglycerides. You can also end up with impaired concentration and memory, brain fog, moodiness. I mean, we all know how we feel if we don't get a good night's sleep. The next day is just a little more difficult to focus. Um, it can also contribute to depression, bipolar disorder, and anxiety. So these are some of the physiological effects of circadian disruption. Um, these things I've already mentioned for the most part over here on the left side. Um, and you know you can also see neurotransmitter imbalances. And as a result of that, you can see perhaps high afternoon and nighttime cortisol, which contributes to dysregulated sleep, um, especially if you have that delayed sleep phase. Um, you're going to go to bed later and you're gonna wake up later. And so you're gonna see that cortisol rhythm is off. Um, you'll see a lower delayed melatonin output. Um, and you'll also see low-grade chronic inflammation and dysregulated inflammation. So when people start to develop a sort of metabolic syndrome type presentation uh, and they start putting on weight and um, especially um, uh, in the central area, belly fat, it serves as a source of inflammation. Ex excess adipose tissue is an inflammatory tissue. And so you exist in this state of low level inflammation and metabolic syndrome and that dysregulated blood glucose management can also result in a dysregulated inflammatory reaction. So, you know, in the presence of COVID-19 right now, we know that the comorbid conditions are hypertension, uh, type two diabetes, and obesity. And so that's kind of a metabolic syndrome presentation. And these kinds of people do not fare well in the presence of an acute infection because they have a dysregulated inflammatory response. So in the presence of an acute infection, their body isn't gonna uh, dampen that inflammatory response very well. It will tend to uh, spin out of control into that cytokine storm that is what makes the infection with this virus so dangerous. So those comorbid conditions predispose to that sort of dysregulated inflammatory reaction. 
So diseases associated with circadian disruption, I think, you know, it's pretty obvious here. Type 2 diabetes, as I mentioned, metabolic syndrome, cardiovascular disease, cardiac arrhythmias, hypertension, sex hormone imbalances, reproductive issues and immunological imbalances, psychiatric disorders, depression, anxiety, and bipolar. You know, these can be part and parcel of these mental health disorders, but they can also be triggers for them. We see premature aging, obesity, sleep disorders, GI problems because of dysregulated function within the GI tract. You know, when you speak of the peripheral clots that regulate all of these tissues and their functions, if we're not eating at the right time, things aren't going to digest well. And we can end up with some gut issues as a result. And cancer. Um, you know, cancer is really very general in terms of its relationship to circadian disruption, but when we talk about like melatonin production and having enough melatonin around, um, one of melatonin's functions is that of an antioxidant. And so when we don't have enough melatonin around, we don't have that free radical scavenging. It's a very potent antioxidant. And it's, you know, some of the literature has shown that in people with cancer, they tend to have very low melatonin levels. So um, that can be problematic. All right, so metabolic syndrome. I wanted to focus on this a little bit because, you know, especially in women and, and men too, um, it can lead to sex hormone imbalances. And, you know, so it's, it's important to address this on as many levels as possible. Um, I'm not going to go through describing the symptoms because we've already done that, but this is primarily the result of lifestyle issues. There's going to be always in some people genetic predispositions, but it's those epigenetic factors that we have control over. So avoiding a high carb, high calorie diet. Uh, getting enough, uh, getting a lot of nutrient dense food and remaining active because we know that high carbs, high calorie, low nutrient dense foods um, are uh, coupled with sedentary lifestyle. It's just, it's, um, it's a recipe for disaster in terms of what's going on metabolically. We know that associated disorders with metabolic syndrome in women are PCOS. Uh, infertility in men, low sperm count and quality. And we can often see um, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And if that progresses, it turns into non-alcoholic steatohepatitis. And also we can see cardiovascular disease. So the, this is a, a big problem. About 30% of the population in the United States has metabolic syndrome and about 25% worldwide. And you see, um, levels of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease tracking along with that. So both of these things, which are very prevalent in developed countries, um, are related to each other and they're also related to diet and lifestyle. So this is a big problem, but it's, it's very easy to address. So metabolic imbalances in sex hormone in women. So insulin resistance impairs normal oocyte development and negatively impacts ovulation. So that, that follicle within the, the ovary um, that develops um, and allows for us to ovulate successfully and in a healthy way is impaired in people who have insulin resistance. Without ovulation, there is very little progesterone to balance the effects of estrogen. High levels of insulin increase the output of ovarian androgens by stimulating the release of luteinizing hormone from the pituitary or increasing luteinized hormone receptor sensitivity. This is commonly what you see in PCOS. High insulin leads to decreased levels of sex hormone binding globulin, leaving a greater percentage of testosterone and estrogen unbound. So in women who have PCOS who have high, in, high fasting insulin, um, they may typically have high sex hormone or low sex hormone binding globulin. So they have a higher level of free testosterone circulating around. And that is what's causing those androgenic symptoms of hirsutism or acne. High testosterone levels in women plus low sex hormone binding globulin are associated with metabolic syndrome. 
So here's basically just a diagram of everything I just said. Okay, so you've got genetics, you've got epigenetics, and you have lifestyle. All of these things can lead to hormonal changes that are exacerbated by carrying around excess weight. So you, you exist in this state of low-grade inf inflammation. And because of those hormonal changes and that insulin resistance, you can end up with hyperandrogenism. And the clinical presentation of that may be hirsutism or acne. Um, reproductively, you don't ovulate regular, regularly there's irregular um, menstrual cycles and low fertility. And then there's that metabolic syndrome component that goes hand in hand um, with, with the presentation of PCOS. So metabolic imbalances in sex hormones in men. What we tend to see are, is decreased testosterone and sex hormone binding globulin associated with metabolic syndrome. Obese men with insulin resistance frequently exhibit reduced levels of gonadotropins and testosterone, impaired semen parameters, altered androgen to estrogen ratios, and erectile problems. Low testosterone contributes to abdominal obesity, and conversely, abdominal obesity contributes to low testosterone through aromatase activity. So um, what ends up happening is that, that adipose tissue serves as a place where there's a lot of aromatase activity going on, converting testosterone to estrogen. Low testosterone level can affect insulin sensitivity and increase the risk for diabetes. Elevated insulin levels characteristic of type two diabetes may have detrimental effects on testicular Leydig cells and reduce fertility. So this whole condition of having elevated insulin is not good. Uh, for the reproductive capacity of men. It affects um, sperm production and the health of the sperm, and it also affects the level of testosterone. So again, here's a diagram. Um, you know, poor food intake, dysregulation and appetite control, that's the ghrelin and leptin that we talked about. Um, disruption, disruption of the HPT axis. Um, you're, you see increased blood pressure, increased insulin, um, you see uh, issues occurring in the liver because of the presence of higher glucose, high fatty acid uptake. Um, so you can see fatty deposition in the liver. That's where you have non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Um, you see stuff with ghrelin going down and um, you see decreased sensitivity to leptin. So and this results in decreased testosterone um, and higher estrogen and changes in gonadal function. And um, so it's, it's not a good picture overall. So how do we assess these parameters? You know, in, in serum, so we talked about you can test for, um, you can look at cortisol through salivary uh, hormone testing, and you can look at melatonin through urinary metabolites. Um, so that's one way of looking at some of those circadian markers and looking more specifically at sex hormones. You can do serum testing. Um, I think it's important to always look at thyroid function because that does have regulatory activity um, over ovarian and testicular function and output of sex hormones. So always doing a good thyroid panel, looking at metabolic markers like fasting glucose, insulin, hemoglobin A1C looking at uh, lipids, looking at sex hormones, estradiol, progesterone, free and total testosterone, and looking at sex hormone binding globulin. So all of those in women, in men, you're not necessarily looking at progesterone, but you can look at estradiol, uh, free and total testosterone, and sex hormone binding globulin. So um, if you don't want to have to go and do a blood draw, you can do blood spot testing. And you know you can do salivary testing for hormones as well. But if you want to look at some of the metabolic markers, um, you have to get those in blood. You can't get them in saliva. So um, through ZRT lab, they do have blood spot testing. And so for women, the best profile to run is the ZRT lab female blood profile too. Um, you can see all of the markers that it has here. Um, it does do a blood spot cortisol, but that is cortisol that is both free and bound. Um, for men, the ZRT lab male blood profile too is good. And if you want to just look at the cardiometabolic profile, where you can look at fasting insulin, 
um, high sensitivity CRP, hemoglobin A1C, total cholesterol, HDL, LDL, VLDL, and triglycerides. So these are good panels that can be done through blood spots. So it's nice to know we don't have to go to a lab, you don't have to get a blood draw if you don't want to. Um, but so this is just an option. All right, so let's talk about how we reset the clock. How do we address our understanding of the circadian rhythm and actually use that to make ourselves healthier? So there's three key events that support and regulate the circadian rhythm. We've got sleep, timing of meals, activity, and movement. So sleep is very important. I think we all know that. We have to sleep. You know, it's just, it's important for us to get a good night's sleep so that we can reset ourselves and rejuvenate ourselves. Sleep is a, sleep is a key reset mechanism for the circadian rhythm. The urge to sleep builds up as the day progresses and we need about 20 to 30 minutes of sleep for every hour of wakefulness. So adults need about seven hours of sleep per night. Um, some people need a little bit more, you know, it usually ranges in between seven to nine hours, but minimally we need about seven hours of sleep. And our sleep alternates between quiet and active sleep. Active sleep is REM sleep, and that's when we dream. And those cycles occur every 90 to 120 minutes. And so in a seven, seven hours of sleep, we might go through about four sleep cycles. Sleep, qu quiet sleep allows the body to relax. It allows the body temperature to drop, the heart rate and the breathing to slow while the immune system is enhanced. Active sleep enhances learning and memory. So quiet sleep has one function, active sleep has another function. And sleep is also for repair and recovery. We increase our output of growth hormone when we're sleeping, which is responsible for repair of tissues. Uh, we repair our neurons, we have muscle repair, we synthesize proteins, we conserve energy, and we detoxify. So what can we do to enhance sleep? So these are just basic uh, sleep hygiene recommendations. Light exposure we know can inhibit the urge to sleep. So reducing exposure to blue light, dimming house lights, um, so that you can deactivate those melanopsin receptors. I talked about this a little bit ago. You wanna make sure that your last meal is about three to four hours before bed because digestion helps to keep your core body temperature elevated and you want your temperature to drop and you want things to kind of slow down to enhance melatonin secretion. You wanna to get to bed between nine to 10 p.m. is ideal um, because the hours between 10 p.m. and 2 a.m. provide the most restorative sleep. You wanna keep your room temperature between 60 to 65 degrees if possible, because the coolness, keeping your body temperature low, again, enhances melatonin output. And you wanna try and cover all sources of ambient light, particularly blue light. It's really amazing how a single spot of light, like from a cable box or something, can light up a room when it's really dark. So covering those light sources is important. It's important to hydrate throughout the day so that you're not dehydrated at night. So a lot of people, they don't drink much through the day and then they drink all of their water in the evening and they have to keep getting up and use the restroom. So that can wake them up and cause fragmented sleep. You wanna spend as much time as possible in bright sunlight. So get outside, sit near a window, open your, open your blinds. Um, it's important to get light during the day when we're supposed to get light. Try to avoid caffeine in the afternoon regular exercise early in the day, um, ideally no later than 6 p.m., but you know, for some people when they work, that's they might have to exercise between six and seven or whatever, but late in the evening is not a good idea because it raises cortisol and it makes it difficult for you to relax. So engage in activities that enhance relaxation and reduce stress. You often find that if you're up and moving a lot, you know, in the, like, let's say it's like, you know, 930 and your goal is to be in bed trying to fall asleep by 10. If you're still up and moving around, you may not feel that tired. But if you allow yourself to sit down and relax, keep the lights dim, you'll feel that urge to sleep come over you because you'll think that you're not tired until you actually sit down. Circadian disruption occurs with elevated afternoon and nighttime cortisol levels. So again, test your saliva or urine and see what your cortisol levels look like. Support sleep onset with supplemental melatonin as needed. If you find your melatonin is low, you have difficulty falling asleep, you can always try a little melatonin. Timing your meals is important because we're designed to digest food during the day. And we're not designed to digest food all the time 
you know, we, we're not di designed to digest food 12 hours of the day. So reduce the number of hours that you're consuming food. So there's a philosophy called time-restricted eating where you uh, reduce the number of hours of food consumption to eight to 12 hours per day. Um, and this allows enough time between meals to support digestive function. Um, and you're really trying to, con you're trying to stick to consuming two to three meals without snacking. Some people are great with two meals, some people need three meals. But the idea is to limit the amount of time that you're eating your meals. So if you think about it, if, if your first meal is at eight in the morning, but you don't have dinner until nine, that's like 13 hours of, of eating and digesting food. So if you can reduce that time frame down, it helps your body to actually tap into uh, your stores of energy. And having enough time in between meals allows your body to tap into your stored sources of energy, which is uh, stored glucose and adipose tissue. If we're always eating and snacking, your body is gonna use the most readily available source of energy, which is the food you just ate to support its functions. But if you're not eating, if you're allowing enough time between meals, your body is forced to tap into uh, your stored energy sources. So you're kind of retraining your metabolism to burn your stored energy. So time-restricted eating, you know, people will ask, well, what's the difference between that and intermittent fasting? And there's really not much. Um, I think intermittent fasting is a little more restrictive in terms of the window of food consumption. They may reduce it down to like eight or six hours. Um, and it may be more restrictive in terms of macronutrients. It's kind of coupled with the paleo diet and other you know, carb restrictive diets. What time restrictive eating allows you to do is optimize your digestive capacity because you're allowing time between meals um, that supports the migrating motor complex in your digestive system so that the food has the opportunity to actually move through effectively. It's that, that migrating motor complex sweeps your food through your digestive tract. And if you're always consuming food, it kind of turns off that migrating motor complex. And this is one of the issues with people who have SIBO, SIBO um, is that their migrating motor complex is dysregulated. So one of the suggestions in the treatment of SIBO is to not eat between meals, to allow three or four hours between meal consumption so the migrating motor complex has a chance to work. Your last meal should be um, three to four hours before bed. You know, So you don't wanna be eating an hour before you go to bed because it raises your body temperature and you're having to kick into digestion mode. And the later you eat in the day, or into the evening, the, the worse your digestive capacity. All of those digestive juices are, are turning down. So their circadian rhythm is that they're gonna be heightened in the, in the morning and kind of taper as the day goes on, as your food consumption goes down. So if you eat a meal late at night, you're not going to digest it very well and you may end up with reflux. So that's not a good thing. Also, digesting food requires a lot of metabolic energy, so reducing the number of hours of food consumption frees up metabolic energy for other things. So timing your meals, um, as I said, TRE allows you to tap into stored energy sources, okay? I'm not gonna go over this again. I think you kind of get the idea of what the fed state looks like, fasted state, tapping into your stored resources. The peripheral clocks of the digestive system, the liver, the stomach, and the pancreas are optimized to support digestion during daylight hours. So activity and exercise, that's the third thing to help regulate the circadian rhythm. Exercise and physical activity support a robust circadian clock with better sleep at night and wakefulness during the day. Our metabolism and physiology are timed to support physical activity throughout our wakeful hours. The American Heart Association recommends 150 minutes of moderate or 75 minutes of vigorous exercise per week. This equates to about 30 minutes of exercise five days a week, which is not really much. You know, I always compare it to like getting on social media or on the computer or whatever. You know, we can burn 30 minutes, you know, doing nothing significant. So, you know, you might as well get some exercise. So you wanna include a combination of aerobic resistance training, stretching and balance exercises. You wanna have a combination of all of these things, not be like a mono exercise. 
um, because it recruits different kinds of muscle fibers. It works on different things. You know, you want to be supple so that you have some flexibility. You want to do balance exercises. So as you get older, you know, if you trip on something, you can recover easily without injuring yourself. So focusing on these key four areas of exercise are really important. It helps to keep your body balanced. Morning exercise outdoors or in a bright space can enhance brain function. It improves your mood, enhances cortisol production, and increases metabolic rate well into the day. Um, you know, so even like stepping outside in the morning in the bright sunlight to try and turn off that melatonin and enhance that cortisol output is a good idea. A lot of people, if you have a garden or you're, you're going to go outside or you're going to sit outside, drink your coffee, whatever, try to expose yourself to bright light in the morning. Late afternoon exercise between 3 and 6 p.m. is optimal for strength training or other intense exercise, team sports like basketball, uh, football, soccer, you know, it's, you want to train for those more competitive things that require um, a lot of coordination because that's when your ability to do those activities is peaked around that time. And I know that's not always convenient for people because of your work schedule, but um, you know, it depends on the activities you're partaking in. You just have to find a way to work exercise and activity into your life. Exercising in cold air also activates brown fat, which is rich in mitochondria, to produce energy and support the use of fat as fuel. So um, don't shy away from getting outside when it's cold. It basically is like, you know, free calorie burning just to stay warm. So when it comes to activity and exercise, just try and move as much as possible. Um, you can use technology to track your activity levels, you know, like people were tracking their steps with the goal of getting like 10,000 steps per day. Uh, if you have a more sedentary job, you can certainly set a timer on your phone to get up every hour and move around for a few minutes to stretch and to move and to just uh, get your body moving. For most people, walking can be done anywhere, anytime. Just walk outside your door. Uh, for people who work indoors or are sedentary, if you have a lunch hour, get outside, move around, and expose yourself to some bright sunlight. Exercise supports brain health by increasing brain-derived neurotrophic factor, which also supports neuronal repair, strengthens neural connections, and improves memory. So it's not just good for your body, it's good for your brain. Exercise reduces fasting glucose and enhances insulin sensitivity. So it's one of these things that it's good for everything, right? It enhances sleep. Uh, it enhances brain function, and it optimizes your metabolism. Muscles will take up glucose when you're active and exercising in a way that's not dependent on insulin to shuttle it into the cells. So if you, if the only time you can exercise is maybe a, a good vigorous walk after dinner, that's great because it helps to reduce your blood glucose levels because your muscles are being active and using energy. So it's going to uh, help to take glucose out of your blood and lower your blood glucose before you go to bed. Late night exercise raises cortisol. It increases your body temperature, heart rate, and blood pressure, and delays melatonin production. It also just dysregulates the circadian rhythm. So um, try not to exercise really late at night. Um, unless you're a shift worker and you really have no choice to, to um, have sort of this dysregulated schedule. So earlier in the day is better. So general chronotherapeutic strategies. You know, we need the extremes of light and dark. We need activity and rest. We need food and fasting to support and regulate the circadian rhythm. We have to have the extremes of both. Lots of bright light, extremely dark at night when we're sleeping. Um, as much activity as you can get so that when you go to bed and rest, you really rest uh, deeply. Um, eating meals, and allowing a time for that meal to digest. So food and fasting. They, these are important extremes that we have to acknowledge support our circadian rhythm. These external regulators support the inherent timing of our physiology, allowing key functions to synchronize and optimize. So all of these things we've kind of talked about here, you know, light therapy, dim light in the evening. So I'm not gonna to go too deeply into those. 
So if you want to be real regulated about this, um, this is something called a social rhythm metric, which helps people to track and time uh, when they wake up, when they have their meals, how much time they spend outside, light exposure, exercise. There's circadian apps on your phone that you can use to help set timing for certain key events to try and optimize when we're supposed to be doing things. Or you can just get, you know, print out one of these things and keep track and, and see how you're doing, particularly if you have issues with not going to bed when you want to or eating your meals kind of randomly or just snacking throughout the day. It helps you to kind of keep track of things and maybe regulate it. And then again, there's a lot of apps on our phones and computers that you can tap into um, that are under the category of circadian rhythm monitoring. Other things to consider technology to support the circadian rhythm, you can use a lot of different things to block out blue light on your computer. There's a few suggestions here. There's a lot of things you can do for house lighting, getting those warm LED bulbs or incandescent bulbs that kind of have an orange yellow glow. Stay away from the compact fluorescence with the bluish kind of tint. Um, you can install dimmer switches, lower the lights as the sun goes down. Uh, there's, there's also programs that have tunable LED lights that will change light uh, according to a timer. Um, when you're using task lighting during the day, you wanna have bright light. So you do wanna have blue light during the day because that activates your brain, it keeps things going. Um, again, using tracking devices and apps and things that you can use to kind of track the timing of events, to track your blood pressure, to track when you ate, to track how much you sleep. So there's a lot of things you can do for technology. It's not necessarily my thing because I don't like having technology and, and um, things on my body when I'm sleeping, but um, some people really like to use that information to see what's going on. Uh, amber lenses, so if you have to do computer work at night or you wanna watch TV, you can get glasses that have an amber lens and block blue light. There's a lot of them that you can find online. Um, television screens, a lot of the newer televisions have these updated screens with like a dark mode that is set to get darker and darker and darker as you watch it in the evening. And because it does it slowly, your eye doesn't really pick up on the fact that it's getting darker. darker. So it's, it's, it's blocking out that blue light. And then when you're sleeping, earplugs and eye masks. Not high tech, but still effective. Okay, so that is my lecture on circadian rhythm. Um, here is just a slide um, with um, Dr. Wohler. This is Integrative Medicine Academy. Um, and we have a number of courses out there for practitioners um, through Integrative Medicine Academy. So if you are interested in any of these courses, go to integrativemedicineacademy.com. And our next course that starts for Hormone Mastery course, this is one of my courses. It's a good basic intro to um, sex hormone balance and um, using bioidentical hormones. And this course starts uh, Tuesday, August 25th. So if you're interested in that course in particular, you can go to hormonemasterycourse.com. Um, we also have a really good functional medicine course. Um, so if you're interested in functional medicine from a broad perspective, you can go to functionalmedicinemasterycourse.com. And also, we have something called Functional Medicine Clinical Rounds, which is a membership for practitioners who um, want to do some mentorship and just ask questions, go over lab tests, if you feel you like need some support or need to have a different opinion with your patients, um, we have functional medicine clinical rounds. And that is that. If you have any questions, I believe that we are, um, I will get some questions emailed to me if you have any questions about uh, the lecture material. And uh, once those are sent to me, I'll respond. Thank you very much.